Hi, everybody. I am Dr. Carrie Nevin. I am a doctor of clinical psychology and wellness coach certified by the Mayo Clinic. And uh, I have a real interest in connecting with those very special people who have their own unique way of supporting mental well being. Did you know that you are a supporter of mental well being? I did. You know this, Ruth? You did? Oh, okay. You did? Yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of different ways you can look at that. Well, it, absolutely. And um, that's why I love doing these and having these discussions because what is mental well being for one person might look different to another. And um, so it is my pleasure to introduce Mike Rizzi, Riz, drummer extraordinaire, singer songwriter, and fellow Maine Enwell High School graduate, Rizzi, as he is known, joins me today on the Let's Talk series with Dr. Carrie Nevin. I reached out to Riz because he demonstrates being a person who uplifts others, not only with your talent, Riz, but with who you are and who you are comes through. And I think that's one of the things that I was most excited to speak with you about today. Um, but even though we have a shared history of going to the same high school together, um, and I didn't know you back then, but there's a way that your energy comes across how you present yourself. And so that's one of the, one of the reasons why I was so excited to talk with you. Mm. I've been following Rizzi for some time on all the socials, Facebook and Instagram, appreciating uh, your obvious love of performing with some of music's most well-known artists, such as John Driscoll Hopkins, co-founder of the Zach Brown Band. Mm. The Sweet yes. Tea, lots of love for him. Yeah. Uh, Sweet Tea Project featuring Ed Roland of Collective Soul. As well as sporting tours, including R.E.M., Sammy Hagar in the Circle, The Smithereens, and one of my favorites, Foreigner, just to name a few. You are yeah. amazing. So not you are also an accomplished singer and songwriter, releasing Appreciate What Remains in 2018, co-produced by your friend John Driscoll Hopkins. Oh, yeah. And this was a, a tribute to your son, Caden. Yes. Um, it's very apparent uh, that Riz is one proud papa. Let me just say that. Um, your first single and video, Great Divide, reached number four for two weeks, grabbing the attention of the Country Music Channel. Well done, you. And this was followed up with your single and video, Here's to All the Years. Rizzi also demonstrates his talents in TV and film role, such as Fox TV series Monarch, appeared in the Netflix series Dolly Parton's Heartstrings. I love um, it. Yeah. Hold up. And the 2018 movie Adolescence, which featured six songs co-written and performed with the offshoot band, The Bloody Wolves of Venice. Which John Hopkins was a part of that one, too. Oh, really? That's oh, yeah. I did not know that. I didn't know And that. a couple of guys from the band Yacht Rock Review, if you know who they are. I don't. Friends. Oh, you need you need to check that band out. You okay, well, I will, because you told me to, so I'm going to yeah, The Yacht Rock Review. Um, but yeah, all of us kind of collaborated, wrote some songs together, and- they said I'd look the part as a drummer. I don't even have headshots. People look at me and they're like, hey, can you pretend you're playing drums? I'm like, I've been doing that my whole life. I think so. I think so. Well, and what I, from what I understand, Riz, you're currently touring as the drummer for the Icons of Classic Rock right now. Is that yes. right? Yeah. And this is a tour that's featuring singers um, from Boston, Survivor, ACDC, Santana, Foreigner, Quiet Riot, and Estelle. Especially the romantics mm -hmm. and the lifelong dream for you to play with them. And I yeah. understand that this stream was put on hold and the tour was canceled or, or they were canceled due to an injury of a member in the band. Yeah. When you actually do get to play with them, how sweet is that going to be? Well, I, yeah, as I told Wally when uh, Wally Palmer, when he asked me, he's like, would you be interested in doing this? I'm like, I've been rehearsing for this gig since 1982. So what's a couple more months? You know, I, I mean, I've waited this long and it'll happen. It, it, it's unfortunate. We were supposed to play Summerfest in Milwaukee, which is a huge festival. I've done it a couple of times with uh, previous bands, yeah. but we'll do it. It'll get You're there. I'm going to do it. And I'm going to be so excited for you when you do, because oh, me too. realize your dream like that. It's just, and I'm, I'm imagining that the, you are realizing your dream in terms of what you're what you do on a daily basis, uh, and it's funny. Um, the first time I considered reaching out to you, I saw the words "Uncle Jan" in my head. I was like, "That just dropped in from like nowhere." So, can you share with our listeners today who was Uncle Jan? Who was in that? Just yeah, 
Um, so it was uh, Steve Spellacy and I started having like a knack of writing songs together. And I remember the first time he was like, hey, you want to... Well, first of all, everybody in New York has basements. So I felt like those were venues. And we would walk three or four miles in the snow and just get to his house. So I did that. I, I got to his house. We started writing. He had some ideas and I was just kind of whipping up some words and melodies. And we, um, so Steve Spellacy was big one, uh, Kevin Trinkowski on bass guitar and Corey Layton on rhythm guitar. We always said Corey was the pretty, the pretty guy. So a lot of times, you know, just if you don't know it, just kind of pretend you're playing it. You know, you, you got the looks. <laughs> And you know, I was a I was a bossy little sucker at that time, but wow. I were, I was I was supercharged. You were supercharged, and I think it, it fits in with your personality of of taking charge because you. I mean, well, let me ask you this question: Did you know one day that this would be your life? Did you have absolutely? Any idea? You always knew that in your heart. Kindergarten, in kindergarten, you knew that. Wow, how does that even happen? I, I can't believe I remember it that far back but I do I remember they um I had a teacher Miss Krulichek I don't know if you remember her, but she I'm went around the classroom what do you want to do and everybody was saying doctors lawyers garbage men whatever it was I'm like I want to be a drummer I want to be a professional drummer at, at five years old you knew that yeah I started at three and a half playing drums reading music which I don't really read anymore I, pr I probably could dive into it and figure it out a little bit but I just got past that, but I, that was the first thing I did. I think I knew drum rudiments before I fully knew the alphabet because my cousin Ray was a, a really schooled, meticulous drummer, you know, marching band. So he had me sit down and learn it right. Um, I still don't really know it right, but I just do what I do. And, but I knew I was going to people do know. I think some people believe that you do it and you know it right. It, it's it's impulse at this point. I think there's a lot of um, impulse and, you know, I'm going back into a band that I played with for nine years out of Athens, Georgia, 5-8. I've got two shows this week with them. It's not like I went and said, okay, I've got to go study them. It's all like kind of muscle memory. Mm -hmm. It's really crazy, but I just kind of go with crazy. Yeah. It, Wow. And so there's like a level of um, belief in yourself and trust in yourself to be able to show up and be with these guys, even though this isn't, you know, a band that you've necessarily toured with. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I did. Well, actually, we that we were on the REM tour in 2004. Oh, you were. Oh, okay. They handpicked us, which was like beyond cool. And they were awesome. And it was like, I mean, I think my first gig in Los Angeles was at the Greek Theater, which was kind of like mind blowing. Wow! So yeah, we I toured a lot with them over nine years, and um, yeah, but I think a lot of that confidence came from the auditorium at Main End High School. Yes, I completely appreciate that because those are those formative years, and you know, with what you were doing you made yourself so available for connection because you had this passion and you had this love and you had this belief, yeah. this knowing. I, I, I didn't, I've never realized that. I never, like the way that you just said that to me, I think I was so engrossed in trying to make it happen or when it was going to happen. I, I joke around a lot with people and say, uh, I went to high school because I wanted to know when the battle of the bands were going to be. <laughs> so that was uh issue for you yeah and and to this day i i do believe this those shows were my favorite shows that i've ever played wow it was just amazing excitement you know a little twerp singing what i like about you overnight because mike decatur was in the band earlier you remember yes, yes. And kevin patch so they were in the band earlier and Decatur was singing and I always kind of like give Decatur credit on this. He yeah. turned to me and he said, come on, you sing one. And I'm like, uh, what? He goes, well, um, let's see. I know what I like about you. Can you do that? I'm like, yeah, I think so. Then I just started drumming it and singing it. And they're like, you're the singer. Oh, I'm like, yeah. I did not know that. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. My God. Well, 
you know, I'd love to really delve into our discussion today um, about the attitude of gratitude, mm -hmm. which figures in not just the posts on the social, but on the album, appreciate what remains. Yeah. So the concept of gratitude and appreciation is one that I practice with my patients as a way to opening up the space so that you're available uh, to receive information that mm -hmm. when you're in fight or flight, you don't necessarily have access to because you're shut down and you're shut up. Mm -hmm. um, so always interested when I see someone purposely choosing gratitude the way you do. And here's a quote that I absolutely love of yours. Sometimes nothing changes accept your attitude and the perspective you have on what's happened to you. In the end, I hope the lesson everyone experiences is getting to a place of gratitude. So Riz, can you talk a little bit about how gratitude and appreciation plays a role in your life and influence the album, Appreciate What Remains? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, it's crazy, but uh, I think the gratitude and that attitude behind it all started in Endwell. You know, Endwell was a beautiful, beautiful little town to grow up in. Yeah. And we didn't have much. We had our abilities. We had our abilities to, to share, like you're saying, connect with people, being musicians and all that. Um, but what it comes down to on the album, I remember something so definitively. It was with... Steve Spelsey, we went to go, we went to the concert at the Broome County Arena, yeah. which was the firm, Jimmy Page, Paul Rogers. Yeah. And we walked in and there was this guy with all this hair playing a drum solo. And they said, that's John Bonham's son, Jason Bonham. And I had to go meet him. I, I felt like drawn, like I know my way around the arena and like, yeah. hey, are, you, are you John Bonham's son? He goes, I sure am. And we started talking and he's like, hey, you know, I'm going to come up and watch a concert with you. And I'm like, no way. So we sat there and watched a concert and he was, I'm asking him questions about his dad. I'm like, I hope you don't mind. And this was 86. He had some earrings and there was swan song earrings. And I'm like, wow, that's so cool. He gave me that. I boldly asked him, Jason, if there's something that your dad could have left you that you would really want, what would it be? And he said notes. And I'm like, I never forgot that. I took that home like, I will always leave notes for the children I have or whatever in the future. And so appreciate what remains is all of these lessons that when I leave this earth, my son's always going to have. And he can pass those along to his family. And, in, and so on and so on. So all the songs are these lessons that are disguised as song. Mm. So, you know, this love there's, letters too, right? Yeah, exactly. And, and I never forgot when Jason told me that I don't really know Jason. Well, I just saw him even about four years ago. I wanted to tell him this story, but I was yanked on stage. We were opening for them and uh, it, it really made an impact in my life. And then John Hopkins, Hop, as everybody calls him, he kept coming up to me like over the years going, when am I going to get a Mike Rizzi album? <laughs> I'm like, uh, and I have something to say. So I had something to say, Yeah, raise the money to do this out. And he's like, okay, this was February. He goes, when do you want to put this album out? I said, Father's Day. He goes, you're kidding me. This is like, we don't have that time. And I said, let's make that time. And we did, and we put it out. And um, so it, it it all started with a line that I remember I woke up, or I, I woke my wife up. Mm -hmm. It just said, uh, with all the things we lose, appreciate what remains. You know, that that's what my parents kind of taught me. You know, always, always look at what you have in more than what you don't have. Mm -hmm. So that... That was ingrained, that uh, gratitude and appreciation. And so that that's how the whole album kind of came across. And I was just writing my emotions, like, here's to all the years. That song is written in the video, is written about the importance of family to my son. Mm -hmm. Then Great Divide, that means, you know, he lives in Holland. Right. And he's lived in Holland for 10 years. 
And I'm like, how do you keep a relationship with your son or your daughter from a distance? And for me, it was like every single day we talk, I make it fun. We have a lot of, we have a lot of fun. We are as close like he lives next door. Aww. I wish he did, but he doesn't. And, but we're, we're very connected and he's always asking, how's my album selling? <laughs> I'm like, by the hundreds. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think I ran across a video of him in, in a car singing and it was so strange just so precious and he was so joyful he was little little because i think did he just graduate from high yeah school? yeah yeah he just graduated from his school in holland and he's uh, i just got off the phone with him he's doing an internship you know a couple of different internships it's great because they teach them here's the real world yeah if you remember i think it was um adult life Remember, I think they, they called it that and I can't teaching them how to balance a checkbook and going to the supermarket. I mean, they do a lot of that over in Holland. So his education is like really good. That's amazing. That's amazing. So, you know, I, I thought about this question and, and I thought, you know, what are the biggest challenges of your job? And then I thought, would you even call this a job? Uh, <laughs> it depends on the day. You know, I, I mean, it's when they say the music business is a roller coaster, no joke. It's a backwards and forwards roller coaster. Mm. But I've I made a pact with myself at a young, young age. This is what I'm going to do because it, it, it completes me. It makes me feel whole. Mm. When I play, I don't think about what I look like. I don't think about anything but to contribute whatever it is that I'm doing to the song and that's live and that's in the studio. Yeah. I, the abilities to be able to do what I do are, I mean, yes, it, it could, it looks better on paper sometimes. Well, because you're, you're not seeing what's going on behind the scenes. Like it looks pretty glamorous, right? You're <laughs> traveling and you're with all of these famous people and they're super talented and you get to be a part of it. And, you know, there's an amazing energy that happens when you get a, an arena full of people together that are just vibing on what you guys are doing. I'm the I'm the kid in the front row on stage in the best seat in the house. So every time that, you know, when we were traveling with the Zach Brown band, I was playing with a girl named Sonia Lee, a, a great singer songwriter. And we um we would open up all those venues on the Red Rocks, and I would always be looking because it's like um it's like people watching at an airport. Yeah. But I have a drum, it drums in front of me. It's probably because I never really danced. I'd rather hide behind the drum kit, you know that kind of. Thing. So I'm sitting there looking, and and I've got my eye on who I'm going to give the drumsticks to, where they're usually the young kids, because. When I go to a concert, I'm still a young kid. I'm like looking to catch a stick or whatever. It, so to be in this position is so satisfying, like to the top level. Yeah. And, you know, so how do you keep yourself grounded um, emotionally with the demands of the kind of work slash play you do? I think, you know, like my wife, she's very understanding. She's a professional photographer, so she's able to understand travel. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think that's why it took me when I was 45, I got married for the first time. So I'm like, yeah, she understands it. I think the demand and how you stay grounded is just knowing that it can be pulled away tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And, and it has, things have been, you know, like things are great boom, they fall. Yeah. I mean, so when the pandemic hit, it was yeah. really not a surprise for me. Yeah. And uh, I remember telling Tony, cause we were just up, we were in Haiti on the eighties cruise. When I found out that everything was closing in America, like it was shut down. I can't make it up. I was in Haiti swimming to a, a bar that's in the middle of this little ocean, you know, right off the shore. And people are like, everything is closed down. Immediately what I thought of, everybody's going to know what it's like to be a musician now. 
you have you, it's almost you have to fend for yourself. You have to figure it out. I wasn't so surprised. Mm. Uh, a lot of people had a lot of issues with it, a lot of hard times with it. I just said, okay, here's time to use for me. And I wrote, I think, 30 songs. I just, I've been so busy, I haven't been able to get to those, but it's, it was satisfying and um, venting. You know, you're able to vent through music. Uh, Atlanta traffic is terrible. Mm. I lived in LA for a while. That traffic was terrible, but I would always tell everybody, and I still do, have a little drum set in the corner of your house. So when you come home, you just get it out. Get it out. Yeah. Get it yeah. out. Oh so, my God. I love that. Um, so, you know, speaking of your wife and, you know, you've had some, <clears throat> excuse me, close people um, recently go through some very significant health challenges. Yep. Uh, I had a, I'll leave it to you to discuss what you would like to or not, but I'm interested in knowing how you dealt with those challenges and what's if there's been takeaways what have they been yeah well it, it it's weird because there's two particular ones um uh john driscoll hopkins uh, about a year and a half ago was diagnosed with als and again he's a multi-instrumentalist uh co-founder of the zach brown band i've known hop since 96 97 mm -hmm. um that was a shock, you know, he, but it's, it's very slow progressing. Thank God. And he's got hop on a cure.org, which is an amazing, an amazing, um, charity where he's trying to find the right people. They're, they're raising funds so they can, Hey, somebody over here in this hospital or this medical team needs this person to come in because they have something really crucial to add to the mystery of ALS. He mentioned at one point to me where I had my aha moment. It's like people with AIDS, you know, HIV. Mm -hmm. For years, it was like death sentence. Now they're able to live a normal mm -hmm. life. So we're looking for, you know, he's looking for obviously big things to sustain anything from getting worse, medications. So he's a driving force and... So that was, that was challenging, you know, the first couple of months, you know, my, my heart was bleeding for his family because we're, we're the closest of friends, but just like he does for everybody else, he started, he said, if this is my mission in life, I'm going to do this. And he, and he does it. And we couldn't be more proud of him. Then my wife, uh, getting her um, at 50. Now they say it's 45 years old, get your colonoscopy. Well, she had a colonoscopy and they found a tumor and it was cancerous. And they, it either colon or rectal, but I think it was colon rectal cancer. Mm -hmm. Within five weeks, she had this diagnosis. We were our own advocates and just, we need to get in there. We need to get this out. Mm -hmm. We had to find oncologists. We had to find surgeons. She had the major surgery. She's just pretty much healing up right now. Yeah. But then, like after like five weeks later, they're like, you don't have cancer anymore. So how do you absorb? I, I, I'm so proud of her because I don't, I'm, I don't know how I would be able to absorb in five weeks that I had cancer, went through a major surgery and don't have it anymore. We're, right. we're totally blessed. She got it early and, uh, you know, she's always saying, go check your butts out there. Yes. Yes. I saw, I saw the, uh, graphic <laughs> <laughs> thought it was such an amazing way to communicate, you know, with humor, go get your butts checked. It's, yeah. It's yeah. Funny. And it's, it's scary. I mean, that all goes with how you stay grounded, mm -hmm. you know, when there are highs there are going to be lows and there's a song so high that I have on my album, appreciate what remains. And, and that's about the, uh, the music industry. Mm -hmm. When you're high up, just know that there's low, you know, it, it's just the roller coaster ride, but life is that way. You know, I mean, how would we know what was incredible if we didn't know what was 
you know, just terrible. So you're talking about the contrast there. And I, I was just yeah. having this conversation with a patient just before I got on with you. It's like, you know, how are you supposed to know what happiness is if you don't have that sadness? And um, I was listening to a podcast recently where, you know, it's a choice. So the question was, can you be in pain, feel overwhelmed and make it worse or make it better? And the truth is that you can direct your focus to making it better because your focus in, um, is connected to your perspective and how you're going to see things. And that's the lens you're looking through. That's Amen. what you look at, right? Your... Amen. That's what we did. Yeah. That's what we did. I, I, for some reason, I didn't feel like that urgency to be scared. I was really focused for her. I'm like, hey, what can we do? Because she would do the same thing for me, you know. You know, God forbid anything happens like that. She would do the same thing, and we just stayed focused. We're like, you're gonna beat this. You got this, and we were believing it. So I, I really, I, I really believe what you just said. Yeah. The yeah. will to live. Yes, the will to live, and to know that you know you can cultivate this, just like you grow a plant. And nurture it with sunlight and with fertilizer and with water and attention. Um, you can nurture a belief. And this is one thing I work on a lot with people is, well, you know, I've had all these bad experiences. So, of course, I have these beliefs and expectations, right? And then, lo and behold, the same kinds of experiences keep happening. And so the question then becomes, well, what are you going to do differently to get a different result? And the truth is it takes courage. It takes courage to hope. It takes courage to risk. It might not work out. Um, but where, you know, your focus goes, your experience comes. And so it sounds to me like both you and Jolie really just put your heads together and yep. we're like, okay, what's the next thing we need to do? So we're at the base of the mountain where you're not thinking about climbing to Everest to the top right now. We're going to make base camp and then we're going to think, okay, so how far do we want to go? And then we'll make camp again and then we'll make camp again. And, you know, that's how you get to the mountain. Yeah. And we were just, that's exactly how we were. I'm, I, I would say, look, you have two choices. You could be positive or you could be negative. Mm -hmm. If you're positive, you know, you, uh, a therapist said once, and I thought it was the biggest thing ever. Uh, my wife was talking to her and she said, like, but I feel like if I don't do this, you know, I, it can lead to this. And she just said, you're not that powerful. <laughs> right. I, yeah. It stuck with me. We are not that powerful. So think positive, because if you think negative, you're going to open up the door for anxiety, torment. There's so much. But if you stay positive and you stay focused. I think you can overcome a lot, a lot. And I think that's where we were. That's what we did. That's amazing. Uh, there's a great author by the name of Byron Katie. She's a woman. Mm -hmm. And she wrote um, The Work. It's called The Work. And it's based on a system of inquiry. And her basic tenet, Riz, is that um, all of our suffering is really derived from our thinking, yeah. from our thoughts. And so within the work, there are these four questions. And the first question is, is it true? And the fact of the matter is you never walk in anybody else's shoes. You really can't know what is true for someone. Mm -hmm. So the second question is, if they say yes, like, can you know for certain? No, you really can't. The third question is, what happens to you or who do you become when you think that thought? I become angry. I become despondent. I become overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the fourth question is, who would you be without the thought? Well, I would be relieved. I would just be focusing here right now on the present. I wouldn't be, you know, forecasting what I imagine the future to bring. So look, when you're headed toward a tree, is it appropriate to feel anxiety? Yeah. Like there's appropriate use of sure. negative feeling. Sure. But don't, you know, you don't necessarily have to put yourself through that. And it sounds like Jolie did your best to make the best of it. 
Absolutely. I mean, she was joking right up until she was wheeled right in. Oh my God. And I mean, she's, I'm pretty, I'm pretty crass with jokes, you know, I, <laughs> and she was beating me. I'm like, I don't know if I can laugh at that one. She goes, you can't laugh at it. I'm like, yeah, okay. Well, I, I would tell her, listen, don't worry about it. Everything is going to work out in the end. You know, <laughs> like, I'm, I'm sure. sure. I'm sure. You were just back and forth. Had a good time with that, didn't you? Yeah, we did, and and that's our relationship. Is you know we do. You have to you have to laugh. I mean, we we all have our worries. We all have you know excitement. I and mean, that's where my my next record's coming from. It's all falling, departures and arrivals are. It was really started where the last one ended. Where I have to put Caden on a plane. I'm like, oh, it's dread. Yeah. But there's times where I'm like, I'm so excited and celebratory touring the world. Like, it's great. Then I'm like, well, looking for songs in an airport to write about. Then I thought, hmm, we all are departures and arrivals. We all are in and we die. Me, find the middle. Find find where life lets you live it. Mm -hmm. Right in the middle. And, and that's where these songs are kind of going. It's almost reminding me it's reminding others so that's that's kind of a little insight of what i'm been working on i should say i love it i love it to me it's all i hear is that it's all about connection yeah. and and speaking about connection one of the most important roles in your life is that of dad to your son caden what would you say caden has taught you oh that i've just how to look at things so innocently and so uh so much that's a good question he taught me how to be a better me oh. from day one from day one wow the, the, his smile is his smile when he was a child it just it stopped everything in my head about me and I would look at him and be like I will do anything for this this little guy mm. and it's, it's never going to go away I, mean, I don't care how old he is no he's going to do baby. that you're always your baby yeah he's he's taught me he still teaches me like he's so loving and loves animals just knows everything about animals and then you know I've always thought about maybe learning another language like Italian when I was younger but again I didn't do that because I was too interested in when the battle of the bands were or whatever it was <laughs> I was always focused I always go back to that this kid went over to Holland and picked up Dutch fluently so quickly that's I'm, not real yeah and I look at him and I'm like how he's healthy he doesn't even drink like you know coca-cola he just one day I will. i'm like no 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 you don't have to no don't do it don't do it it's just <laughs> in you yeah yeah but he teaches me he teaches me um a a, a greater deeper appreciation of love mm. absolutely i mean just a, a wonderful wonderful soul i mean he's just a, the the greatest thing ever i'm so happy and you know that is something too that is very obvious to me when uh, you write about him or you write about Keaton's coming into town or uh, it's just very palpable, the the beautiful connection that you have. Um, and I love how available you make yourself, you know, and one key I think to you, Riz, is your capacity for vulnerability your capacity to allow yourself to be seen mm. is to me um you know when they do studies on vulnerability there's a great gal by the name of dr Brene brown who studied the oh, yeah. vulnerability who i'm sure you're familiar with yep, yep the world is and um you know she said these are the most successful in life kinds of people mm. people who you know allow themselves to be seen oh well, that's funny I'm sorry. That's funny you say that because it reminds me, a lot of people were not expecting this record out of me. They were expecting, you know, crazy drums and animal, all that. 
I didn't care. I didn't care. Like, I don't care about what people think when I'm expressing my emotions, even on a post. There's nothing that is, it's all 110% pure because yeah. it's how I feel. I guess as a songwriter, you're able to be very vulnerable and, and throw out what you want. But I grew up as a songwriter. Yeah. Kind of didn't realize it, you know, at a young age. But with Caden, it's just, it's really simple to say my feelings to him. You know, my dad was a very loving dad. But, you know, he, he was a different type of way. I'm like, okay, how do I build upon my relationship with my dad, with my son? Yeah. And other fathers, other father figures, trying to figure out what suits our relationship the best. I mean, there's a lot of humor. There's a lot of, uh, he calls me an instigator because I do, I instigate him. I mean, you like to poke a little? <laughs> you know, my friends. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're all, they were all instigators. So I, I instigator 101. I've gone to that school. Yeah. You have. Yeah. Of course. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll see Caden like, you know, on FaceTime. Yeah. How you doing? And he's like looking over here and I could see the white in his face. I know he's looking at the computer. So I would get this bad Elmo doll out. And <laughs> put that away. You you know, you're going to influence the world in a, in a bad way. I'm like, hey, I need your attention. Yeah, of course. At, yeah. At a young age, I told him, I said, if you want to be respected, shake someone's hand, give them a good handshake and look them in the eyes and talk to them. Yeah. When, because, you know, the more focused you are, the more focused they're going to be back at you. Yes. Yeah. We have a, I just, I just, I'm over the moon that I have a boy, that son, he's just the best. You are over the moon and I can see it. And it's, yeah. it's, it's so, it's such a beautiful thing. Mm. And speaking of, you know, a, a time, you know, with Caden being young, right? Was there ever a time, here's a question I really like to ask. Was there ever a time or if there ever was a time in your life when you questioned whether or not you could overcome a challenge? Knowing what you know now, what would you say to that you from before, from the past? What sage counsel would you offer that you, that you didn't know then? Um, you know, I, I think it, a lot of it, I kind of go back to you know, a, a traumatic part is when he, you know, it's mother and I and my wife, we all get along really well. We're, we're like very, very good friends. So we have this communication. Um, a lot of people always say, I would take a bullet from my child. Well, it may, you may not have a gun in your hand, but I took some bullets because I knew that there was family over in Holland and, you know, I didn't, we, we didn't want to interrupt his mom and me, our relationship to, to take care of him. He meant more to me than anything. Mm -hmm. So I had to look at all of what Holland had to offer. And, you know, it was just, it was hard. That was very, very hard. What I would tell myself now is just breathe, make a plan, figure it out. And I did that. I eventually did that. I mean, at first I was really, you know, resistant. Anybody's going to be resistant. I'm like, he needs his father. Yeah. But we, you know, I just talked it out with him and I made a plan of, here's what we're going to do. You're going to come to me. We're going to have a blast when Christmas comes around. When the summer comes around, we're, I don't know, what do you want to do? Go to Disney, Disneyland, Disney World, whatever. So it was, um, you know, it was challenging. I think you have to kind of allow the journey that you were born into happen just a little bit more than if you were to like resist it. And that's, I believe we're born into a journey Yeah. and we learn, you have to be aware, you have to be open for other things to come in. Yeah, I'm a little bit spiritual, hippy dippy right now, but that's uh, you're speaking my language. This is where yeah. so <laughs> right. So you believe that, right? Like ten thousand into something, and we have a road to learn from. And I, I don't know, like a lot of people would always give me the sad eyes when they would talk to me about my son, 
And I would always just tell him, like, it's not sad. He's alive. He's healthy. Yeah. You know, I always tried to find the positive over what the negative thoughts can be. It's so easy to be negative. Yeah. It's challenging to be positive. And but, yeah, you have to look at it differently. And and I'm a different breed, so I guess maybe that, that benefits me. Well, that's the invitation. And I think part of the reason why um, you are so successful, and I don't just mean as an artist, but as a person, as who that you are. And um, it has just been such a pleasure to ask you these questions, which are like not, they're not shallow questions. They're like, no. I really thought about this because I really want to know more about Riz. I really want to know more about him. Like, I think I know some things. Um, right. But for sure, I can see the kindred spirit in you. Yeah, likewise. Yeah, likewise. I wanted to show you this before. I don't know if you remember these, but I'm going to plug Uncle Jam right now. Oh, my God. Totally. Oh, my God. I do remember. All of these. Oh, my God. I still, I still have hundreds of cassettes. Because they mean the world to me, just to to know. And I was telling my son about him today. Yeah. And he's like, "Yeah, Uncle Jam was your band in school." And I'm like, "Yeah, but it it's more than a band. It was, it was my invitation to do what I what I do. And you know, my my bandmates are still my great friends. And yeah. it it's just a, you know, I just appreciate where I am and. There are hard days. There are definitely hard days. I mean, when you go up from a high playing, you know, a tour for two years and then boom, it's quiet and it's crickets. You know, it's like, I need to be out there. I need to be doing this. And so I'm getting calls a lot with different bands and uh, I'm blessed. I'm very, very blessed. And I think that um, I've learned more about you today and, and you've, and I've learned more about me today through you. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. You know, yeah. um, when I work, well, when I'm really with anybody, I'm always thinking, how can I be a conduit for my highest good and for the highest good of the person that sits opposite me? So, um, so I'm, I so appreciate you saying that. Yeah, it's, it's the truth. It's the truth. And we're friends now. Yeah, we are so friends. And we need to be friends. And I, I mean, we were. I knew you in high school. And I, knew you too. And, and, <laughs> and I was actually, I was a little shocked that you even knew me because I was kind of, of course. radar a little bit, but um, I'm thinking like, when are you coming to Chicago? So uh -huh. I get to see you. Well, we were getting close to Milwaukee. I mean, that was like, well, we would have gone. Oh my gosh. Listen, I'll, I'll, you will get the treatment when I come to, to Chicago. We'll get you some tickets and passes. And might be the smallest club you've ever seen a show at, or it could be a it could be a venue. Yeah, like I get to see you know. and we get to hang for a bit. And you will act. That yeah. would be a dream come true for me. I I would. We like will. That. That's happening. Ah, you can, so if you put it out into the world, it happens. It's already done. It's right. already happened. We're just catching up to it. <laughs> right, it's done. Well, much love and gratitude to you. Uh, to Joel and to Hop, to Caden, to all the loves of your life, and thank you for sharing uh, yourself with me today, Riz. It means absolutely. Um, it's been my pleasure.